send you a request. You should have received. Ah, okay. It, okay. it just started recording, I think. Okay. Is it recording now? Yes. I. Yes, it's okay. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so the title of this uh, project is How to Prove It with Lean. And uh, I guess Alexander already explained some of what that means, but um, let me just say a few things about it. There are two parts of the title that need to be explained, how to prove it and lean. Uh, so I'll start with lean. Uh, lean is a piece of software and here's the website for it. And you can see it's described as a theorem prover. Um, some people, sometimes people call it a, an interactive theorem prover or a proof assistant, um, but it's software that's supposed to help mathematicians write proofs. Uh, and I think for the moment, I won't say anything more about it, but I'm going to demonstrate it later. So you'll see more about how Lean helps with writing proofs. The other part of the title was the how to prove it part. Um, Alexander held up the first edition, but there's the current third edition of how to prove it. Um, and this is a textbook intended to help students learn to write mathematical proofs. Um, and uh, it does that by presenting a collection of strategies for writing proofs and a systematic method of combining those strategies to construct proofs. Um, and so the, the online book, the title is uh, it's kind of has a double meaning. It's about how to prove things with lean, but it's also about combining the book, how to prove it with lean. Um, the, uh, the motivation here is um, my hope is that students who are learning to write proofs and particularly students who are learning by reading how to prove it uh, could benefit from using Lean. Uh, maybe I'll say a few things about how Lean might be helpful to students. Um, so the obvious reason is uh, Lean can check your work. Uh, you can type a proof into Lean and it will tell you if the proof is correct. Uh, as you type the proof in, if you make a mistake, right away it will tell you, no, there's a mistake here and here's what's wrong. Um, so it gives immediate feedback to students. Um, but there's a second reason why I think um, Lean could be helpful to students. There's a common mistake I've seen students make when they're trying to write proofs. And that's to think that when you're proving a theorem, what you should do is think about the theorem, maybe try some examples, draw some pictures, daydream, somehow try to, try to develop a vision of why the theorem is true, and then write an essay explaining your vision of why you think the theorem is true. Uh, I think this is a bad way for students to write proofs. Um, Often when students write proofs that way, what they write is not precise enough or rigor rigorous enough to count as a mathematical proof. Um, math is full of statements that seem plausible but are in fact false. <clears throat> and if you try to prove theorems by just explaining why the statement makes sense to you, you're likely to end up proving lots of false statements. Um, and the only way I know of to avoid that is to stick to rules for how rigorous proofs are constructed. Um, uh, a, a second uh, problem I would say with this, think about the theorem until you see why it's true and then explain it approach is uh, what do you do if you don't see why it's true? Um, sometimes students have no idea how to start a proof if they don't see why the theorem is true. I think if the only way you know how to prove theorems is to first see why the theorem is true and then explain it, then the only theorems you'll ever be able to prove are theorems that are so simple that you can see why they're true before you write the proof. Um, so I think this is a bad approach to writing proofs and the way Lean can be helpful is that Lean simply won't let you approach proofs that way. Um, the only thing Lean understands is the rules for writing proofs that are in how to prove it and are built into Lean um, and anything else it just won't understand. So, if a student uses lean, they're kind of forced to um, stick to the rules that I think they ought to be sticking to. So those are the possible advantages of using lean uh, to, for a student who's learning to write proofs. Um, there, there is one big disadvantage, which is the same as the disadvantage with any software, which is you have to learn how to use the software. Uh, computer software is often uh, kind of finicky. If you, you, know, you put a semicolon where you were supposed to put a comma and the computer will throw up its hands and say, I don't know what you're trying to say. Um, and, and that could be a particular problem with Lean because it's complicated software. I have to say, it took me a while to get the hang of it. Um, but there is one saving grace of Lean, particularly the latest version, Lean 4, which is that it's customizable. 
Um, and so there are really two parts to the project I've been working on. One part is the, the online book that you see on the screen now, but the second part behind the scenes <clears throat> is that I've been trying to customize Lean to make it more student friendly, um, to make the proofs more readable, and also to align it better with how to prove it. Uh, it already lines up pretty well with how to prove it, but not perfectly. And so I've been doing some customization um, to try to match up lean and how to prove it a little bit better. Um, so as I said, I'm going to demonstrate lean. I thought I would just say a little bit more about what's in the book first, um, and then I will turn to demonstrating lean. Uh, so both how to prove it and lean use symbols of logic to express um, mathematical statements. Um, I've got the chapters of the book listed here and chapter one summarizes some of the symbols. Uh, so I don't know if everyone has seen these symbols before. Even if you haven't seen them, I think a lot of them are pretty intuitive. An arrow meaning if then, a double arrow meaning if and only if, I think those are pretty natural. Perhaps the hardest thing to remember if you haven't seen these symbols before is a V-shaped symbol means or, and if you turn it upside down, you get the symbol for and. So it'd be easy to mix those up, and for the next hour, you'll just have to try to remember V is the one that means or. Not is kind of similar to a minus sign, so again, I think that's intuitive. Uh, there are two more symbols of logic that are used both in the book and in lean, and that's the upside down A to mean for all, and the backwards E to mean there exists. And again, though I think those shouldn't be too hard to remember, A for all, E for exists. The, uh, I would say the heart of the book is chapter three about proofs. And the approach to proof writing in How to Prove It and also in this online book is, um, is to say that when you're working on a proof, you should always keep track of, as you're working through the proof, um, what do you know at this point and what remains to be proven? In the book, How to Prove It, the things that you know at any point as you're writing a proof are, refer are called givens, and what you're trying to prove is called the goal. And chapter three runs through a, a list of, uh, really a systematic list of strategies for writing proofs based on the logical forms of givens and goals. And you see here sections of chapter three, proofs involving various kinds of logical symbols, negations and conditionals, quantifiers, and so on. I thought I would just look at a little bit so this is the section on proofs involving disjunctions. And here you see an example of a proof strategy. Um, this I believe is probably word for word out of the book, How to Prove It. Uh, to use a given of the form P or Q, break your proof into cases. For case one, assume that P is true and prove the goal. For case two, assume Q is true. Uh, so this is what's in the book. Strategies like this, explanation of why that strategy makes sense, examples of writing proofs in English using these strategies. But now you see in the online book, the very next sentence is how to do it in Lean. So in Lean, if you want to break your proof into cases, what it says is use the by cases tactic. Um, I think I won't explain any more at the moment about what that means. I think the better thing to do is just to switch over to Lean. Uh, and you'll see, I'm going to do some examples of proofs in Lean. And in at least one case, I'll do a proof by cases. So you'll see that. Um, so let me see if I can switch over to lean now. Um, so I hope now you're seeing, um, and actually let me get rid of this. Um, so now you should be seeing lean on your screen. Um, and yes. what I have here is a file with a list of, of theorems, and I'm just going to see how many of them I can prove in the remaining time. Um, I'm not going to say a lot about the how lean works, what it does, uh, but I just will make one comment. The, uh, the theory that lean is based on is called type theory. I'm not going to say anything about type theory just except for one comment, which is that in type theory, every variable has to have a type, and the type specifies what kind of object the variable stands for. This is actually, I think, in keeping with mathematical practice. When you're writing a proof, you don't typically say, let x be some mathematical thing. You would say, let x be a real number, or let f be a function, or let a be a set, and so on. Uh, and so lean requires that as well. When you introduce a variable, you have to say what its type is. Uh, well, so let me just plunge into my first theorem. I have a theorem here. I've given it a name, union sub. I hope everyone can see what I'm pointing at here. 
so my theorem is called union sub. Uh, the statement of the theorem starts by introducing three variables, A, B, and C. And uh, Lean is kind of fussy about types. Um, a, B, and C are sets, but that's not enough for Lean. Lean wants to know, well, yes, but what's the type of the elements of these sets? Uh, so these are going to be sets in this proof, sets of real numbers. And so that's what this A, B, C colon set real means. A, B, and C have type set real. That means they're sets of real numbers. Uh, my theorem has two hypotheses. H1 is the first hypothesis. A is a subset of C. Second hypothesis, H2, B is a subset of C. And the conclusion is going to be uh, a union B is a subset of C. Um, ah, so, uh, it's hard to read the screen. I'm not sure I can use a larger phone. Well, I don't know. I've got a lot of lean experts here who can tell me perhaps there's there a simple way for me to enlarge the font. Um, I think in VS Code, you can just, if you are on a Mac, you can hold the command and then the plus sign. If oh, uh, Com command and shift and the plus sign. Man, shift plus sign. Ah, is that bigger? Is a little bit bigger. Uh, I think it got a little bit bigger. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't seem to want to go any bigger than that. Is it really unreadable or just a little difficult? <laughs> I'm not sure I have any other way to adjust it here. Yes, command plus the plus sign. So hold the command and then the plus the, the key of the plus sign. Yeah, I, I, I did that once and I think it did get a little bigger, but um yeah. Well I yeah. Yeah, command plus makes it bigger and command minus makes it smaller, as you learn when your eyes start going. Um Yeah. Oh, did that get a little bit bigger just now? Yep. I think it did. Okay. Uh, now I. Okay, Moisés said that's okay now. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so my first theorem is if A is a subset of C and B is a subset of C, then A union B is a subset of C. And um, and uh, after colon equals is the proof, and at the moment the proof just says sorry. That means. Sorry, I'm not going to give you the proof. Uh, but what I'm going to do now is replace sorry with the proof. So I'm going to delete sorry. And I'll type by. And then I'm going to leave a blank line and put done. And so I'm going to insert the proof between by and done. Uh, what I'm using here um, is what's called tactic mode in lean. And one of the nice things about tactic mode is that you see over here on the right uh, what's called the tactic state. Um, uh, now that I've made the font bigger, I don't know if I should, uh, well, I, I hope we'll have room on the screen for everything. Um, so the tactic state shows you here that I have uh, A, B, and C are sets of real numbers. It shows me um, the two hypotheses. Uh, this sideways T here is called a um, turnstile, and that labels the goal. And this says the goal is to prove A union B is a subset of C. Uh, so in how to prove it, uh, what's listed here would be called the givens, and A union B, a subset of C, is called the goal. Okay, well, how do I prove this theorem? Um, the natural way to prove a subset statement is to let X be an arbitrary real number, assume it's in A union B, and prove it's in C. Uh, so I'm going to let X be an arbitrary real number, and to do that, I'll say fix X. Lean wants to know what the type of X is, so I'll say X is a real number. And you see right away the tactic state has been updated. Now X is here as a real number and the goal has changed. Lean knows what subset means. And so it knows that what I have to prove now is if X is in A union B, then X is in C. And the natural way to prove that would be to assume X is in A union B and prove it's in C. So I'll say assume. Uh, now I have to give this assumption a name. I have H1 and H2 already. I'm going to rather unimaginatively just call it H3. Uh, X is in uh, A. Um, whoops. A union B. Um, perhaps you notice uh, I, I need to type all of these symbols. 
Uh, and so there are codes you need to know to be able to type symbols in lean. But um, if you've used tech, you'll maybe you've already noticed a lot of the codes I'm typing are the same ones you would use if you're writing math in tech. At any rate, again, the tactic state has been updated. Now I have H3, my assumption X is in A union B. This is a new given. And the goal is now X is in C. Um, so as I said, when I was talking about the proof strategies and how to prove it, the proof strategies are all based on the logical forms of givens and goals. And the logical forms are often revealed by writing out definitions. And in particular, the definition of H3 is gonna be the guide to the rest of this proof. Um, and so I have a define tactic. I'm going to say define at H3. And that has written out the definition of uh, X is in A union B. It's X is an element of A or X is an element of B. And now I hope everyone recognizes this is exactly what that proof strategy I showed you earlier was about. I have a given that's an or statement. Uh, the suggestion, the proof strategy was proof by cases. And the suggestion was to use the lean tactic by cases. Um, and so that's what I'll do next. I'm gonna say by cases. Uh, so I'm doing a proof by cases based on H3. And you notice the tactic state has changed quite a bit now. I now have two goals. I have case one and case two. In case one, H3 is X is in A and I have to prove X is in C. And in case two, X is in B and I have to prove X is in C. Um, I think it's useful to uh, label the cases. And uh, so I'm gonna do that here. Two dashes in a row uh, says to lean, the rest of this is a comment, lean will ignore it. And so I'm just gonna label, this is gonna be case one. Um, whoops. In case one, H3 is X is in A. Um, and I'm gonna have done for the end of case one, and then I will put in a label for uh, case two. Maybe one other comment I should make at this point is the way lean uh, tells you if you've made a mistake is by putting a red squiggly line under the mistake. And so at the moment, there are two mistakes in my proof and that's the word done, uh, because of course, case one isn't done and case two also is not done. But as you'll see, when I finish the case, the red squiggle will go away. So uh, case one, I can look at the tactic state for case one and it's very easy. I have H1 is A as a subset of C, H3 is X is in A, and if I apply H1 to H3, I'll end up with X is in C. And so it's just one step. Show X is in C from H1 applied to H3. And immediately the red squiggle is gone uh, no goals for case one, but if I go down now to case two, I see the tactic state for case two. And of course it's the same, this time I'll use H2. And so it's show X is in C, whoops. H2 applied to H3, and now all the red squiggles are gone. And so there's the proof. Um, so I have a, a list of examples here. And uh, I think I'm going to skip over some of them, but try to give you a sampling. And we'll see how much time we have for um, how many I can get through. So my second example is another set theory example. I think maybe I'll skip over that one. And let's try something with natural numbers. So here's a theorem. I've called it DVD trans. Uh, P, Q, and R, nat means they stand for natural numbers. My first hypothesis is P divides Q, the vertical line needs divides. Second hypothesis is Q divides R, and then I'm gonna prove P divides R. Uh, don't worry if you don't know what divides means because the first thing I'm gonna do is use the define tactic to see what H1 means. Uh, so let's say define at H1. Um, and so uh, I hope everyone can see this, it's actually my on my screen, it's a little bit covered up, but I hope everyone can see the meaning of divides is there exists a natural number C so that Q equals P times C. So in other words, P divides Q means Q is a multiple of P. Q is P times something. Um, well, another strategy straight out of how to prove it is if you have a given that's an existential statement, 
you should assign a name. If you know something exists, give it a name. So I know there exists some natural number so that Q equals P times that number, let's give it a name. Uh, and the tactic I'll use for that is obtain, I'm gonna obtain, uh, first of all, a natural number. And secondly, another given that uh, Q equals P times J from H1. And so you notice now J is here in the tactic state and I have this new given H3, Q is equal to P times J. And of course, I'll do the same thing with H2. Uh, it's actually not necessary to use the define tactic. I did it so you could all see what it means. But if you know what it means, there's no need to write it out. Lean knows what divides means. And so I can obtain another natural number. I'll call it K. Whoops. Um, and another given, I'll call it H4. R equals uh, Q times K. And I get that from H2. Uh, and maybe I will define the goal. Define, if I don't say at, it applies to the goal. And so the goal means there exists a natural number C so that R equals P times C. So I have to come up with a natural number now um, so that R is equal to P times that natural number. Well, here I have R expressed in terms of Q. And I know what Q is expressed in terms of P if I just plug this in. If I plug in the formula for Q given in H3, I plug that into H4, I'll have R expressed in terms of P. So there's a tactic for that. It's called rewrite. Uh, rewrite H3, this means use H3 as a rewriting rule in H4. Um, and so what it's done, uh, treating H3 as a rewriting rule means rewrite Q, replace Q with P times J. And that's what it's done here. Um, so I guess it's clear now what the C should be in the goal. Uh, it should be J times K. Uh, and so what I'm gonna do is the way I'm gonna introduce that existential quantifier is the value assigned to C will be J times K. Uh, and now you see, what I, remains to be proven is that R equals P times J times K. It's tempting at this point to say we're done. We have it in H4. Um, and you might say, why don't I just say show R equals P times uh, J times K, whoops, from H4. Well, I get an error message. There's a red squiggle here. And if you look at the error message, well, there's this stuff about type theory. Let's ignore the type theory, but you can see what it's complaining about is a mismatch between R equals P times J times K without parentheses and with parentheses. So what's going on here? Well, uh, lean groups multiplication to the left. And so H4 is saying R equals the quantity P times J multiplied by K. And what I need to prove is that R equals P times the quantity J times K. So I don't quite have it yet. Um, of course, what I need to use is the associativity of multiplication, and I can actually use that as another rewriting rule. So I'm going to rewrite Well, now our H4 has been rewritten using the associativity of multiplication, and now the red squiggle is gone, the red squiggle underdone is gone, the proof is over. Um, what you see here is uh, there's a lot of math that Lean already knows. In particular, it knows in this case that multiplication of natural numbers is associative. Um, and, and this is, uh, well, it's good and bad. Uh, Lean knows a lot of math. Um, all of these mathematical facts it knows have names. There are theorems that are in a library of theorems that Lean knows. But when you want to use those theorems, you have to appeal to them by name. The, the names are intuitive. You can probably guess that if I had to use the associativity of addition, it would be add underscore associ. If I need to use commutativity of multiplication, it will be mul underscore com. Um, but uh, well, some of the other theorems, it's sometimes hard to locate what theorem you need um, and what it's called. Uh, there are ways of searching for theorems. There are some tactics in Lean that are uh, more powerful and are able to figure things out without you having to come up with the names of theorems. 
Um, but uh, well, as we go along, you'll see there are going to be times when I'm going to have to appeal to uh, theorems, and um, it won't always be obvious what the name of the theorem should be. I think I'm going to skip over the next couple. I've got some theorems here about functions onto inverse image. Um, but let me try one that will involve mathematical induction. So here, here's a theorem about integers. Uh, so a is an integer, and I'm going to prove that for every natural number n, a minus 1 divides a to the n minus 1. Uh, and I'm going to prove this by induction. Uh, the tactic I will use is called by induct. Uh, and you see over here in the tactic state, I now have two goals called base case and induction step. In the base case, I have to prove it when n is 0. And in the induction step, I have to prove for all n. If it's true for n, then it's true for n plus 1, exactly the way uh, one would typically do induction in a, uh, in a math class. And again, since there are two goals, I'm going to label them base case. And I'll have a done for the base case. And induction step. Um, you probably noticed already in the previous case, when I have subsidiary proofs like this, I indent them further. OK, base case. Um, what do I have to prove? It's right here. a minus 1 divides a to the 0 minus 1. I, I think I'm going to define that just so we know what we're proving. I have to come up with an integer c so that uh, uh, these pictures are covering it up a little bit on my screen. Um, a to the 0 minus 1 equals a minus 1 times c. Well, a to the 0 is 1. 1 minus 1. The left side is 0. And so the obvious choice for c is 0. So I'll say apply uh, this intro 0. Um, and uh, and now, well, why is this true? It's just a matter of working out both sides. Let me give you an example of one of the tactics that allows me to, that does a lot of the work behind the scenes so that I don't have to refer to theorems. Uh, and so there's a tactic called ring that is able to figure out a lot of algebra involving plus and minus and times and exponentiation with natural number exponents. So um, it was able to figure out the rest of the base case. Uh, induction step. Well, I should uh, let n be an arbitrary natural number. I'll assume, I'll call it IH, the inductive hypothesis is the statement. Uh, uh, whoops, the inductive hypothesis is just the statement um, a minus 1 uh, divides um, a to the n minus 1. Uh, and my goal is to prove that a minus 1 divides a to the n plus 1 minus 1. Maybe again, I'll write out the definition. So I have to come up with an integer now so that a to the n plus 1 minus 1 is equal to a minus 1 times that integer c. Probably at this point, you, you'd have to pull out a piece of scratch paper and do a little algebra to figure out what to use for c. Uh, I've done that already myself, and figured out that the right choice is, um, oh, sorry. Uh, so here I've skipped a step. Um, I need to apply my inductive hypothesis first. Uh, so the inductive hypothesis says uh, a minus 1 divides a to the n minus 1. That's a there exists statement. Since I forgot it, I better make sure nobody else forgets it. Um, so I should get the integer c from the inductive hypothesis. Let's say h1 is um, a to the n minus 1 is equal to a minus 1 times c. Um, OK, now, now I'm ready to say what I want to plug into the goal, and what I want to plug into the goal is 
uh, if you do the algebra, turns out this is the right choice. And so what remains, to, what remains to be proven is that a to the n plus one minus one is equal to a minus one times my choice. Whoops, should be a plus. So I think what I'll show you for this one is um, what's called a calculational proof. Uh, and I think you'll recognize this as a kind of style of reasoning that's often used in math. I'll say a to the n plus one minus one equals a to the n plus one minus a plus a minus one. Now every step here has got to be justified. But this one is just simple algebra with plus and minus. And I've already told you that there's a tactic called ring that's able to figure out that kind of algebraic reasoning. Um, and now I'm gonna factor an A out of those first two terms. Again, this is just simple algebra that ring can figure out. Uh, by the way, I'm getting these errors up here because I haven't finished showing that a to the n plus one minus one is equal to a minus one times c. Um, so now what? Well, now I've got a to the n minus one, and I know here I've got a uh, h1 that says a to the n minus one is equal to a minus one times c. And so let me plug that in. This is a times, uh, a minus one times C plus A minus one. And that's uh, by rewriting. There's actually a version of rewrite that's just called RW that is a little more convenient in calculational proofs. And now if you didn't see before why A times C plus one is the right choice, you see it now because I can factor an A minus one out. And if you factor it out, what's left is um, a times c plus one. And again, the ring tactic um, did I take this right? Um, oh, I typed ah, I see, I typed the wrong thing here. So lean is complete. That wasn't what I was supposed to prove. I was supposed to prove a times c plus one here. Ah, now all my red squiggles are gone. And so there's the complete proof. Um, so in this calculational proof, you can think of these underscores on the left as referring to the whatever was on the previous line. Um, and so that's all of the red squiggles are gone. There's the complete proof of this, this theorem about divisibility. Um, I, I guess I'm doing okay for time. Maybe I will prove, oh, this one, now that the font is bigger, I think I need to. Um, so let me try proving the well-ordering principle. Uh, so that's the theorem WOP. S is a set of natural numbers and the theorem says, um, the well-ordering principle says a non-empty set of natural numbers has a smallest element. And so I've written it here. If there exists a natural number that's an element of S, then there exists a natural number that's in S and every smaller number is not in S. Uh, I wanted to do this example partly because I've been doing fairly trivial theorems. This is one that is actually enough of a theorem to have a name, um, but I'm also going to um, use a few other techniques, in, including strong induction to prove this one. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna prove the contrapositive. So I have a tactic for that contrapose will change the goal into its contrapositive. Um, so that's if it's not the case that there's a smallest element, then it's not the case that there's any element. Um, 
And so let me assume H1, kind of a long statement, not the case that there exists a natural number n, n is in S, and um, for all k less than n, k is not in S. Uh, okay, Lean has accepted that assumption, and it's told me now that I have to prove it's not true that there's an element of S. Um, good strategy for negative statements, if you can re-express it as a positive statement, that's helpful. And there are, I've got tactics for doing that. Quant neg is a tactic that deals with negating quantified statements. So I'm going to prove now for all n, n is not in S, and I'm going to prove it by strong induction. OK, uh, how does strong induction work? Uh, strong induction, it says over here what I have to prove. I have to prove for all n, if for every n1 less than n, n1 is not in S, then n is not in S. Uh, well, so to prove that, I can um, fix a natural number. And let's assume, call it again, the inductive hypothesis. This is the inductive hypothesis for um, um, whoops, for all, what I want to say is uh, for all n1 less than n, um, n1 is not in S. Um, and what I have to prove is that um, n is not in S. Uh, again, I have a negative statement this time. Uh, nothing I can do to re-express it as a positive statement. And so often uh, the way to deal with a negative statement, if you can't re-express it as a positive statement, is to do proof by contradiction. Uh, so I'll give a name to the assumption that n is in S, and what I have to prove is false. Uh, in other words, I have to reach a contradiction. Uh, a technique that's sometimes useful in proof by contradiction is if one of your givens is a negative statement and my H1 is a negative statement, uh, maybe that's the one I should contradict. So I'm gonna say contradict H1. And it has given me the goal now of proving um, that there exists a smallest element. Well, if you look at the givens, maybe you'll see that the n that I've already introduced is going to be the smallest element, because it, here it is. It's in S. But furthermore, I have this inductive hypothesis that says everything smaller is not in S. So the n I've already got, that's the one that's going to work. And so I will introduce that. And so I have to prove n is in S and uh, everything less than n is not in S. Uh, well, I've already got n is in S. That's H2 here. Um, I haven't done this yet, but and intro is for proving and statements. And uh, I already have H2, so the only thing left to prove um, is uh, this statement for all k. If k is less than n, then k is not in S. I'm probably not going to do this the quickest way, but I think I'll do it the most straightforward way, which is let's take an arbitrary k and let's assume. Oh, you, you do you not have it in the hypothesis? Yes, that's why I said uh, that's right. Okay, I, okay. <laughs> I had it with a different letter, and uh, um, maybe I'll I'll finish it this way, and I'll come back and do it the way I, I understand what Kevin wants me to do. Um, Uh, so I was doing the sort of blindly, if you want to prove for all k, if k is less than n, then k is not in S, just take an arbitrary k, assume k is less than n, and prove it's not in S. Partly I wanted to do it that way to illustrate how I go about applying IH. 
So the inductive hypothesis says for all n1, something is true. So I can plug in whatever I want for n1, and I would like to plug in k. Um, uh, so I'm going to show k is not in S, and I'll do it by applying the inductive hypothesis to k. Uh, well, when I apply the inductive hypothesis to k, I get the statement if k is less than n, then k is not in S. And I have k less than n. That's h3, so I'll just apply that as well. And, uh, and that finishes the proof. Uh, now, Kevin is absolutely right that I could have done this more quickly. I could have just said uh, back here, look, the goal actually means the same thing as what the inductive hypothesis already says, just with a different letter. Using a different letter doesn't change the meaning. So I could have just said, look, the inductive hypothesis. Um, let me not bother to write it out. Uh, something I wasn't really planning to talk about today, but I'll just to save a little time, I'll say it now. Sometimes you can leave an underscore, meaning lean, you fill this in for me. I'm too lazy to write it out. Um, and so the conclusion follows directly from the inductive hypothesis. I didn't really need to do those extra steps. Um, all right, I thought I would do one more um, sort of more substantial theorem, and that's down here at the bottom, infinitely many primes. So let me prove that there are infinitely many prime numbers. Here's my statement for every natural number n, there exists a p, so that p is prime and n is less than p. Now, uh, this is a hard enough proof that I'm going to need a number of things. I'm going to need to use a number of things. And so I've got a bunch of stuff here above it. First of all, I have the definition of prime. To say that p is prime means it's at least two, and you can't write it as the product of two smaller numbers. Uh, the usual proof of this theorem, I think that the way I'm used to proving it is to use the factorial function. And so I've put the definition of the factorial function here as well. Factorial of n, or I'm writing it fact of n, uh, and the definition here has got two cases, zero factorial is one, and m plus one factorial is m plus one times m factorial. I've also got a bunch of lemmas here, and I won't explain them. I'll just plunge into the proof, but you'll see as I do the proof, I'll keep getting stuck and saying, oh, there's a fact I need to know, <clears throat> and I have put all the facts I need uh, into those lemmas. Um, so uh, for all n, um, there exists a p such that p is prime and p is bigger than n. Um, let me start by fixing an n. And now I have to come up with this p. So the proof I have in mind, I hope many of you are thinking of the same proof, is that I should compute n factorial plus one. Um, let me give that a name. I'm going to call it capital N. Uh, it's a natural number, and it's going to be n factorial plus one. And uh, I hope everyone knows now what proof I'm doing. I should find a prime factor of capital N, and then the idea is to say, well, that prime factor can't be less than or equal to n, so it must be bigger than n. But the first step is, how do I even know that capital N has a prime factor? Well, I have a lemma up here. Uh, prime factor, it says every natural number that's at least two has a prime factor. Uh, you know, one of the things about using lean, I think, is it forces you to be very careful and say things absolutely precisely and correctly. <clears throat> when you think about it, you realize, oh, it's not true that every natural number has a prime factor. You have to know it's at least two to know that it has a prime factor. Well, so I better prove that capital N is at least two. How do I know that? Well, capital N is n factorial plus one. I better prove that n factorial is at least one. Well, that's my next lemma. <clears throat> fact greater than or equal to one says for every n, one is less than or equal to n factorial. Okay, so let me use that fact. I'll say I have h1, um, one less than or equal to n factorial. And that's just the theorem fact greater than or equal to one applied to n. Okay, good. So now I just have to add one to both sides and I should have that n is at least two. So two less than or equal to capital N. Um, 
Well, this is one of those cases where I can either go and hunt around in Lean's library of theorems and say, is there some theorem that says I can add one to both sides? Or fortunately, there are some tactics that, um, I thought this one worked. Uh, I T H Linareth, it's a typo. Ah, thank you. Yes. So Linareth is another tactic like ring that I used before. One of these tactics that knows a certain amount of algebra and do some, will do some algebra for you. Um, it does linear inequations and inequalities is what it's good at. And so here it's a an inequality where I have to do a little linear operation of adding one to both sides. Okay, now I can apply my prime factor theorem. Um, uh, actually, if I apply the prime factor theorem to capital N and to the fact that now that I know two less than or equal to capital N, I will get an existential statement. I'm gonna do a bunch of state steps all at once. I can obtain my prime number P all in one step. I'll say uh, P is prime and uh, P divides N. And I get that from the theorem prime factor applied to capital N. And that gives me the if then statement, which I then have to apply to H2. And that gets me the claim that there exists a prime factor from which I obtain my P. Okay. Well, that P is going to be the P I need to prove my conclusion. So we've seen this before. Um, to prove an existential statement, I can say I'm going to prove it by introducing the existential quantifier with uh, P as the what's called the witness. Um, well, I've, I've already got P as prime. Uh, actually, I think I'm going to pull that out as a separate statement. Um, I've been giving rather unimaginative names um, to my hypotheses, but maybe this time I'll actually give it a meaningful name. So I have, I'll call it P prime. And this is just, uh, it's just the left half of H3. Okay, well, I have to prove an and statement and I already know the left side. Again, I did this before. I'm gonna prove the and statement. Um, the way I introduce the and is by using P prime and well, I still have to prove N is less than P. Um, I'm gonna prove it by contradiction. Um, so we saw the by contra tactic before. If I assume that N is not less than P, I have to get a contradiction. Um, well, so if N is not less than P, P must be less than or equal to N. Um, this is again, the kind of reasoning that um, Linareth is able to do for me. So P is less than or equal to N. Um, so how is that gonna help me? Well, it's because, uh, it's because of n factorial. If p is less than or equal to n, then p must be a factor of n factorial. That's another one of my lemmas up here. Uh, divide factorial. It says if one is less than or equal to m and m is less than or equal to n, then m divides n factorial. Oh, I need to know that p is at least one if I'm going to apply this fact. Um, do I know that p is at least one? Well, sure. If I if you write out the definition of P as prime, you see the very first thing is that P is at least two. Well, if P is at least two, it's certainly at least one, but I, I better say so. But again, this is simple inequality reasoning that Linareth can figure out. And now I think I have everything I need to use the theorem, the uh, lemma from up top there. Maybe I'll make myself a little more room here. Uh, for every n and m, if uh, m is between one and n, then m divides n. I want to apply that to p, uh, to n and p.
So this is uh, the theorem or the lemma divide fact in P. No, it's not. Um, oh, of course I have to, that only tells me, actually I can probably see it over here. What I've proven so far is simply that if one is less than or equal to P, then if P is less than or equal to N, then P divides. And so I have to apply H6, the fact that one is less than or equal to P, and H5, that P is less than or equal to N. There we go. Okay, uh, how is this gonna help me? Well, I've got P divides N factorial. I also have up here that P divides capital N, or I have it here in H3. Let me write out what those tell me. That tells me I can obtain, um, let's say a natural number C, so that uh, fact N equals P times C. And I get that from H7. Uh, and similarly, I know that um, P divides capital N. That comes from uh, that comes from the right half of H3. So I can say H3 dot right. Um, so uh, remember, I'm looking for a contradiction and I'm almost there because I have N factorial as P times C, capital N is P times D. But remember capital N was defined to be N factorial plus one. If I just subtract H9 and H8, what, I, what I'm gonna get is that P times D minus C is one. Let me prove that. Um, I should probably be coming up with better names for these things, but I'm too lazy and I'm just getting up to H10, P times D minus C is one. Uh, and I can do this again with a calculational proof. I'll just do a little bit of algebra. Uh, so P times D minus C, well, that's the same as P times D minus T P times C. Um, uh, yeah, it occurred to me that you're all probably thinking I'm gonna use ring. I don't think it'll work. Um, uh, and I don't think I wanna go into this for people who know enough math, you'll recognize I'm working with natural numbers here. The natural numbers are not a ring. Uh, so I'm gonna to have to appeal to theorems from Lean's library. Um, Well, there's a left distributive law for multiplication over subtraction. Um, and uh, if I apply that law to P, D, and C, it justifies that first step. Okay, P times D, I know that's equal to capital N. And P times C, I know is equal to N factorial. And so this is just a matter of rewriting with H8 and H9 as my rewriting rules. Uh, now capital N by definition is N factorial plus one. Let me just fill that in. And so this is an equation where the two sides are just equal by definition. Um, and so, Lean regards this as the reflexive law for equality. This is something is equal to itself. Um, and I just have one more step now. This is equal to one. Um, again, I need a theorem from Lean's library that says if you add and then subtract, then things cancel. The theorem is called add sub cancel left. Um, and I'm applying that to n factorial n1. Um, so I've proven H10 that P times D minus C equals one by a calculational proof. Um, and, and I'm almost done. 
I've got one more lemma I'm going to use, which is that if a product of two natural numbers equals one, if m times n equals one, then in fact m equals one. And so what's going to follow from what I've just proven is that p equals one. Um, and that's, uh, what was the name of the lemma? Eek one of mol one was what I called it. And I have to apply that lemma to, um, to the fact that P times something equals one, that, that's H10. Uh, and now I have a contradiction because I have P equals one. And I also have up here in P prime that P is at least two. And again, this is a contradiction that falls from just simple inequality reasoning that the linear rith tactic can figure out. So uh, there's a, uh, not a really hard proof, but a proof of a significant mathematical fact that there are infinitely many primes. Uh, now the proof relied on a bunch of lemmas. Uh, the proofs of the lemmas are actually all here. I've just hidden them. Um, and I think I'm almost out of time, so I, I won't go through all the details, but <clears throat> I'll just show you this one I was proven by strong induction. Um, Factorial greater than or equal to one was also was proven by ordinary induction. That one is a pretty quick one. Um, since factorial was defined recursively, it's not surprising that there are a lot of proofs by induction here for factorial. Um, so here's the proof that uh, a number between one and n divides n factorial. In the induction step, there's actually inside that a proof by cases. Um, and to prove that if a product is one, it's equal to one, I actually found it helpful to prove first, if a product equals one, then uh, one is less than or equal to M. And I used that to prove uh, if a product is, if M times N is one, then M is equal to one. Uh, basically the idea was to say it's one is less than or equal to M and then turn it around by community of, commutativity of multiplication and say one is also less than or equal to n. Uh, use that to prove m is less than or equal to one. And now finally, that means m has to equal one. Okay, well, maybe I should uh, stop there and see if there are questions. I do have a few more theorems that I didn't prove. And if anyone saw one that they really wanted to see the proof of, I suppose I could do that. Or probably people have other questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, and a very nice presentation and demonstrating uh, uh, live code and link. Very nice. Thank you. So, uh, Moacir, I don't know if he, uh, uh, people in the room has questions and how can we do that? Maybe you can write on the chat or if people here that uh, remote also just open the mic and, and make the question. Yeah, think that so, Daniel, I have, I have a question. Um, yeah. So, where you use uh, exists intro uh, uh, in in textbooks, we're often uh, prone to use the um, the tactic called use. You know, we're prone to say use b because that just right. sounds nice. So, do you do? Is there a reason that you prefer saying exists intro? Um, so, I, I had a reason. Um, it's not a strong reason. I could be talked out of it. <laughs> um, one reason is I thought that I, I did want to explain exists intro. Um, if you um, if you want to, um, well, it, so Jeremy and I were just in a three day Zoom conference uh, the last few days. One of the topics that came up was working forwards versus versus working backwards, um, and sometimes you might be working forwards, and you might want to say, well, I. I know something is true of P, and so let me say, therefore, there exists something for which that's true. Um, so I, I thought it would be good for people to know exists intro as a rule that can be used to, um, to uh, prove an existential statement. Um, I also thought, um, 
well, you'll notice that I used apply exists intro and I also used apply and intro. Um, so this gave me kind of a uniform way of working backwards from statements of various different forms. If you're trying to prove an existential statement, um, the apply tactic um, is, uh, I actually don't particularly like the name apply. I wish there were a name that suggested more strongly that it's a work backwards tactic. Um, so the apply tactic works backwards. Um, and what's going on in, in these two steps here is um, really the same idea. In this case, we're working backwards to prove an existential statement and it's an existential statement is proved, proven using the exists intro rule. And here I'm working backwards to prove a, an and statement and an and statement is proven by using the and intro rule. So I thought it gave me a little bit more unified um, way of dealing with goals of different forms. Uh, I didn't demonstrate it here, but if you were proving an or statement, you might use apply, and then there are rules for introducing uh, or to prove a goal. So my, the choice I made was, um, let me use apply as a uniform way of working backwards from goals of various different logical forms. And then what I have to tell the user or the reader of how to prove it with lean is, what are the rules for um, justifying these various different logical forms? And many of them have are something dot intro. Yeah, that makes that makes perfect sense. Daniel, uh, Moacir is asking if you can make the the user SHT dash five three seven PCA the, the host again. Oh, um, probably. Mm -hmm. How do I do that? Um, you if you, if you click on participants, you you have a list. Ah. Of left and then you you click on yes. this particular user with the right uh, which one what, sht SH, yeah, exactly and then yeah, i think 537 pca yeah make make co-host or make host make host yes both will work i think I, I i assume that he's trying to do something to have the audio uh did that work i, I think he's host now Yes, I think this is all. Uh, Moacir, do you want to say something? I think they are trying to type some a question in the in the in chat. The chat. Okay. So meanwhile, I have a question. So a uh, quick question. Uh, yes. So you, you mentioned in the introduction that you are kind of created some, some additional uh, customization on top of Lean to, to help you in the book. I'm curious about this. What the, in, in what direction, what kind of uh, those customizations? So, you mean new tactics that would help? Yes. Tactics, okay. Right. So, uh, I mean, people who know enough about Lean, and there are a lot of people here who know a lot more about Lean than I do, uh, I'm sure recognize that a lot of what I did here was not standard lean tactics. Um, so I said at the beginning that I was using tactic mode. Every one of these lines is invoking a, invoking a tactic. Um, and tactics are um, little programs that you, you invoke a tactic to say, I want to do this or that step in the proof. Um, so uh, have, for example, is a standard tactic, apply as a standard tactic. Um, um, oh, I guess we're looking here at a proof I didn't do. This is the um, one of those lemmas that I, where I've shown you the, the proof. So by strong induction is a tactic I wrote. Um, fix and assume are tactics I wrote. Um, they're really very simple. They're sort of wrappers around the standard uh, lean tactic intro. Um, so most users would, if they wanted to introduce n as an arbitrary natural number, or if they wanted to introduce an assumption, in this case, it was the inductive hypothesis of an induction proof, uh, they would use the lean tactic intro. Um, I was trying to make my proofs look a little bit more like how you would write the proof in English. And so I introduced fix and assume as tactics that, as I said, just behind the scenes invoke um, intro. But they also give appropriate error messages. If you tried to use fix when you should have used assume, you'll get an error message that says, no, no, fix is only for 
uh, when you're proving a for all statement. Um, so other tactics, I wrote the define tactic um, is one that I wrote. Um, De Morgan here, I, I didn't use that. I used contrapause, I guess, in a, yeah. one of my proofs, but uh, disjunctive syllogism, this is a tactic I wrote. Um, if the so, flag is the unfold, right? You you basically made that wrapper on, on the unfold, right? Yes. Um, so as I said, there are people here who know a lot more about lean than I do. Uh, yeah. I never really learned to use unfold. And the reason is I didn't always know what definition I was unfolding. I uh, for example, um, well, I mean, I used it. When did I? The first time I used it was here when I defined um, divides. Well, what I have here is a vertical line. Um, I, I don't think unfold vertical line would do it. Um, the lean experts here can tell me um, if I knew that the vertical line behind the seams is interpreted by lean as meaning, you know, there's some name for the divides relation in lean. I think that's what I would have to unfold. And my feeling was uh, students aren't going to know that. Um, and so I wrote a tactic that, that goes and finds the right thing to define and defines it. Actually, for the lean experts, I can say define is very similar to WHNF. It's, it's not exactly the same. I did some, some uh, adjustments to try to make it do what I wanted it to do, but that's roughly what it's doing. Thank you. At any rate, it's, it's uh, as you said, it's similar to unfold, but you don't have to say what's being unfolded. You can just say, this statement, tell me what it means. I see, yeah, very nice. I think Marci put a question here on the... Ah. On the... Um, um, so uh, the, the worry is that... that um, um, the, the first question there was uh, a worry that, that perhaps there's too much automation here available to the student, that, um, that too much might be done automatically. Um, so I have to, I suppose I should admit right at the beginning, I'm retired uh, and so I don't have access to students anymore. <laughs> uh, so I actually have not tried this out with students. Um, I mean, I suppose the test will be if students try this out, are they going to be doing too much automation? <clears throat> My guess is if anything, there isn't enough automation. Uh, and what I mean by that is most of the time using lean, uh, you can very naturally say, I wanna use this or that proof strategy. And then every once in a while you get to something like this where you have to say, oh, what's the name of the theorem? in the library that will um, that I can use. Uh, I wish in all of these cases I could just say to lean, look, any high school student knows the algebra necessary for this step. Um, and the fact is, well, sometimes you can do that in lean with tactics like ring or linearith. And sometimes you can't, or maybe I should say sometimes I don't know enough about lean to know how to do it. And so I find myself having to search for theorems in the library. Um, this again is a subject that came up in this conference that Jeremy and I would, were just at. Um, I think the level of automation that would be helpful for students learning to write proofs is actually a little higher than where Lean is at the moment. Um, but uh, well, maybe we'll get there. Um, I see there was also a question about whether the tactics in this demo are all in the, uh, so Pietro was asking about the uh, lean package, which I have in a GitHub repository that people can download. And the answer is yes, those are all in, um, uh, in fact, here, uh, I didn't explain this stuff up at the top, but I've imported a file that defines all of these, all of the tactics I'm using. By the way, for the lean experts, this option I set here was so that existential quantifiers would display the way I wanted them to in the, in the uh, tactic state. Um, I wish that were the default, but 
um, that's not up to me. <laughs> so, uh, Moisir also asked about the search for theorems, uh, how to how to search in the library for theorems. Yes. Um, so I, I have a there's a little bit of discussion of that in the how to prove it with lean book. Um, there's not a lot of discussion. Um, I, I could do a little demonstration of um, sometimes I find it easiest to find theorems in the library by stating a little example, a little toy example um, that I can see is is based on some um some fundamental principle that's surely in lean's library of theorems and so here's an example if n is a natural number n times one is n that ought to be in the library and there is a tactic this is not my tactic this is a standard lean tactic called library search um did i not said unknown is it saying unknown tactic um, oh, here we go. No, it did give me an answer. Um, so, um, oh, it didn't give me the best answer I could think of. Monoid mole one n. Um, and there's also a way of looking up what does a theorem say. Um, And uh, well, it's for beginners, this is probably a little mysterious, but this is what the monoid mole one theorem says. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff that you can ignore and it says A times, uh, if uh, it says A times one equals A. Um, I'm a little surprised it didn't give me the natural numbers version of this theorem, but at any rate, um, this library search tactic is, is one of the ways of searching for theorems in the library. Uh, I find uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, there's also a, a website that um, where you can search through the library sort of by hand. Um, sometimes you can just guess the name of a theorem. I mentioned before that you can probably guess that this must be the name of the theorem that addition is associative. And um, well, there it is, add associative, sure enough. Um, says A plus B plus C equals A plus quantity B plus C. Um, once you get the hang of it, once you've found a bunch of theorems in the library, you can sometimes guess. Um, and there's also, maybe I should say, If I just typed add underscore and stop, um, I should get a little pop-up menu. Yes. So here are a whole bunch of theorems that start with add. This is a bunch of theorems about addition. Um, here's the add associative, here's the commutative law. Um, oh, I could just pick one. Oh, did, is this one that I actually used? Um, Add, add, sub, cancel. Uh, what does it say? A plus C plus B minus C equals A plus B. Um, and that's true in any additive commutative group. So that's another way of locating theorems in the library. If you have a guess at perhaps how the name of the theorem might begin, you can get this pop-up menu and then search through and see if you can find the theorem you're looking for. But I have to say, I find finding theorems in the library difficult. And um, for students, that I see this as one of the biggest obstacles to students using it. Yeah, I, I guess that uh, it's a similar problem that you have when we want to, to teach students how to program in a, in, in a, in a new language, right? It is the same problem, right? At some point, once you start to write some more complicated code, you have to kind of uh, um, spend some time and the necessary time to kind of uh, be more 
uh, uh, knowing the, the the environment that you you are playing with and what kind of libraries there exist and what the, are the libraries that you should use in situations in similar right. situations so all of this uh, is is yeah. like you spend time with the thing and then you kind of uh, start to have more clues right? yeah. There are people here who know far more about lean than I do. I don't know if any of them have suggestions about <clears throat> the best way to find theorems in lean's library. Uh, let me see if we have more questions. Uh, uh, I think there is a Zach asked something. Oh, uh, Leonel just said, great talk, had to go to another meeting. Uh, oh, okay. Zach said, uh, Daniel, thank you for the talk. What's the current lean state of art? I've heard of interaction of neural networks. Oh, neural networks. I know I nothing that. about that. Uh, yeah. I don't, does anyone else here know about that? I, I don't know anything about that. Um, so I, I I I know that there are people here that know know things that have been doing on on that. But uh, I, I, from my side, I would suggest take a look on the Zulip channel. Uh, that is this uh, Zulip place is a is a kind of a, 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 a website where people can make questions, and there is a huge community there, uh, and there is a whole channel talking about. Uh, uh, the use of um, neural nets and deep learning together with their improvers. So I would suggest people interested in that to take a look on, on the on the conversation that we have there. Uh, I don't know if Jeremy or Sebastian would uh, add something more concrete. Um, I'm sorry, say it again. What was the question? I was... the, the, the question is about what's the current state on interaction between lean and neural networks? Oh, there, I mean, there, there are lots of projects and experiments and uh, and so on. Yeah, I mean, there are, people are doing interesting things. People are experimenting with code pilots and and things that nothing, uh, nothing to write home about yet, but there are some interesting experiments. Yeah. Um, question for the organizer. Ah, Piet Pietro is asking if the, the 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 presentation was record. Yes, I'm record. Actually, I think I will stop by now, and I will make it available and let people know. So if you, if you're interested, just write to me, and I, I I could I can put that on on YouTube and and have a private link so I can share with people that is interested in that. So thank you very much. Then I don't know if you have any anything else to to conclude or should we? No, I think I've said everything I can think of saying. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to once more thank you very much. It was a very uh, it's a pleasure to me. It was a pleasure to meet you to have a chance to 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 meet you not in person but at least in this <laughs> in this more direct connection. Big fan of you. I'm, 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 I'm it's a shame that we are not in the same room because then I would have you sign my book. But thanks <laughs> for, for the next opportunity. Thank Some, you someday. <laughs> thank you very much. And All thank right, well, you thank you for the thank you for the opportunity to speak. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. So I think you can close, Mosi. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Bye.